and then we will discuss it. I'll tell the meaning of the words while I'm opening it. So the, this verse essentially talks about Krishna is expressing his love for Arjuna. And he does that by stating that among all forms of knowledge that I have given, now what I'll give you is the most confidential. Sarvabhuyatamam bhuyaha shrume paramam vachaha Most confidential knowledge I'll give you. Again. Shrume, please hear from me. These are my topmost words. Paramam vachaha And why am I speaking this? Ishto sime You are very dear to me. And not just dear to me now, Dudham Iti. You will be constantly dear to me. Why is this? I can use this otherwise. Dudham Iti. Anyway, let's wait. I'll explain the words. You can start reciting. Through it in it. Let us start reciting the words. Then you can set it up. You have your time. Tato Bakshami Tehitam. Therefore, for your benefit, I am speaking these words. Sarva Guhyatam Ambhuyaha. Sarva Guhyatam Ambhuyaha. Shrunume Paramam Vachaha. Shrunume Paramam Vachaha. Ishto Sime Drudhamiti. Ishto Sime Drudhamiti. Tato Vakshami Tehitam Tato Vakshami Tehitam Sarva Guhyatam Ambhuyaha Sarva Guhyatam Ambhuyaha Shrunume Paramam Vachaha Shrunume Paramam Vachaha Ishto Sime Drudhamiti Ishto Sime Drudhamiti Tato Vakshami Tehitam Tato Vakshami Tehitam Sarvaguhyatamam Bhuyaha Sarvaguhyatamam Bhuyaha Shrunume Paramam Vachaha Shrunume Paramam Vachaha Ishto Sime Drudhamiti Ishto Sime Drudhamiti Tato Vakshami Tehitam Tato Vakshami Tehitam Do you like this? Sarvaguya tamambuya, Sarvaguya tamambuya, Shrinu me paramam vachaha, Shrinu me paramam vachaha, Isto shi me dridhamiti, Isto shi me dridhamiti, Tato vakshami te hitam, Tato vakshami te hitam. Sarvabhuyatam ambhuyaha Sarvabhuyatam ambhuyaha Shudu me 
परमं वच सी मे दृढ़ोमी तथो वक्षा ते हित So, this verse actually describes Krishna's love in five diff- different ways. Sarva Guhyatamam. That I am telling you the most secret, the most confidential knowledge. So, we don't tell something is secret or something confidential to anyone and everyone. Mm-hmm. If we do that, then that means either it is not secret or we don't understand what is the secret. If we tell everyone, it is, isn't so, and we tell some. So, that itself, somebody says, I will tell you something secret, something, then that indicates a sign of affection, of trust. Your trust is much more than affection. Sarva Bhuyatamam. And now Bhuyaha. Bhuya again. Now sometimes this could mean a derogatory sense. I am telling you the same point again and again. Don't you understand it? So it's not like that. So Krishna is very much aware that Arjuna started hearing the Gita in a very conflicted and afflicted state. And he was in tears. And in such a situation, see, Arjuna was hearing the Gita in a situation of both external and internal distraction. Externally it was a battlefield. And in the battlefield the war was about to begin. It was a climactic moment. Everybody was waiting. See, right now, see, right now we were trying to set up the mic. Now suppose it's of one or two minutes, it's starting 15 minutes. Now, when we are setting, we are trying to set it up, we are acutely aware that everyone else is waiting. So, when we are trying to fix things, we are also aware. Mm. So, like that, Krishna and Arjuna are in the limelight, in the middle of the two armies. So, they are aware, oh, no, we are making everyone wait. Arjuna is prime, making everyone wait. So, that's a, it's a high octane situation. So, the external distraction because of the war. And more than that, Suppose we are trying to fix something and that time we are also agitated by something. So he was in such agitation that he was in tears. So when Krishna is saying Bhuya has spoken to you, it's not out of a sense of criticism. You, know, you fool, you didn't hear attentively first time, that's why I'm telling you again. No, I understand that this is a distracting situation for it. And therefore, in case you missed it the first time, I'm going to repeat it again. So that also indicates concern. See, love can be expressed in many different ways. Love can be expressed through hugging and other physical forms of affection. But depending on situation, if somebody is in, say, a child comes back home from school, Mommy, I'm hungry. The mother says, I love you. Mommy, I'm hungry. I love you. I'm hungry. I love you. Well, if you love, then provide the child some food, isn't it? <laughs> so, love is expressed in different ways at different times. So, so, here, Krishna is expressing his affection for Arjuna. Expressing, yes, I know, he's showing his concern, his awareness of Arjuna's difficult situation. And he's saying, I am speaking this to you in repetition now, because I'm concerned for you. Shuru me, now here. Repeating again here, Paramam Vachaha. Paramam Vachaha means this is the topmost words. Now, sometimes something might be secret, but if there is two small children talking, I'll tell you some secret. 
with a secret. You know, I kept my doll, I kept my toy in my fridge. <laughs> it's a trivial secret. It's a secret, but it's a trivial secret. But Paramam Vaja is not a trivial secret. It's the most vital knowledge. Supreme words. So, in general, when a, when a speaker is giving a class, sometimes the speaker wants to emphasize certain points. And then they say, even if you forget everything from this class, just remember this one point. That indicates that this is the most important point. So similarly, Krishna is indicating Paramam Vajaha. You know, I gave you so many instructions, but now I will give you the topmost instruction. Ishto Sime Dhrandi. That he says that I love you. Ishto, you are very dear to me. And Dhrudhamiti. Dhrudham means that I am determined to love you. Now sometimes we care, care for someone and that person keeps doing things that exasperate us. That irritate us. It seems as if we are trying to connect with them and they are deliberately trying to sabotage the relationship. Sometimes they feel like that. So Krishna is sitting over here that I am determined to love you. Earlier in the ninth chapter, Krishna was describing the characteristics of devotees. At that time, he said that devotees should be determined to love Krishna. Satatam kirtayam toma yatantasya drudhakrataha. So the same word drudha, determined. Now Krishna is using over here. Drudhaviti, ishto sime drudhaviti. That even if you get confused, even if you get lost, even if you are on the verge of taking bad decisions, even if you take bad decisions, Still, I will keep loving you. Ishto sine dhramiti. That means basically God's determination, we talk about this later, but Krishna's determination to love Arjuna is far greater than Arjuna's capacity to defy or thwart Krishna. Krishna had come to assist Arjuna in fighting the war. He had ready to become, he had become a charioteer. Which is itself for a great warrior like him, and for him, he's not just a great warrior, he's God himself. He had taken a menial position for Arjuna's sake, and then after that, Arjuna says, Yeah, you know, maybe I don't want to fight. That's like you get the, you decide you want to go to a trek, and the president of Australia becomes your chauffeur. And then you're about to go on the trek, you're going on a drive, he says, Maybe I don't want to go. <laughs> so, what Arjuna was doing was quite, could have been exasperating or infuriating. Krishna says, Ishto sime drudamiti. I am determined to love you. And then finally, Tato vakshami te hitam. I am speaking this for your benefit. Now, in general, the Gita is, Krishna is the well wisher of everyone. But, there are many things spoken by Krishna in the Gita. And there is much philosophy which is all meant for the benefit of Arjuna. But specifically, Krishna is emphasizing this is, emphasizing, this is not just philosophy being spoken for the sake of explaining philosophy. It is philosophy spoken for human application, for helping others. Sometimes we may study philosophy in academic classes, in humanities. It is interesting, but it, is, it can be interesting. But it's very abstract. Okay, this philosopher thought this, and this philosopher thought this, and this is wrong with this philosopher, and that is wrong with that philosopher. The Bhagavad Gita doesn't philosophy for doesn't present philosophy for abstract intellectual titillation. It presents philosophy for tangible practical application. I'm speaking this for your benefit, Krishna says. So this in this way there are this five intensifiers or you can say five emphasizers which convey Krishna's love for Arjuna. The first is most confidential, Sarva Guhyatamam. So I just put the Sanskrit word in the brief. Then second is Bhujaha. Again. If you are ready, I'll speak again. Are you able to see this? Yeah. Then Paramam Vachaha. Supreme words. Then then Ishto sime drudham iti. Drudham iti. Ishto drudham. You are determinately loved by me. 
Tato Vakshami Te Hitam For your benefit. So each of these are conveying they, all what they do is they are conveying Krishna's love for Arjuna. Each of them in different ways. That this so the first one indicates trust. I'm taking something very confidential. The second in, indicates concern. That I know you are in a strict situation. So love can be expressed in many different ways. The third. The third, Parmam Vajaha, it stresses the importance. Now, what we are talking about is very, very important. So, we may talk, we may just have a uh, casual talk with, a small talk with people who are acquaintances. People are very close to us, we may have very great talks with them. Then, Ishto Sine, this is directly an expression of the heart. Hmm? I am determined to love you. And this is an expression of intent. This is for your benefit. So, in this way, in many different ways, Krishna here is expressing his love for Arjuna. So, the intent is, this is not simply like abstract, mm, for abstract, the philosophy is not spoken for abstract intellectual titillation. It's for a tangible, practical application. So, now this is going on. When I, I had spoken on this topic, so one devotee, he raised his hand with So he says, does all this, when Krishna is expressing his love, so I said, how Krishna is expressing his love, so much in the Bhagavad Gita, says, does all this apply only for Arjuna, or does it apply for all of us also? What do you think? All of us. All of us. So there is nothing special about Arjuna? <laughs> so, how many of you this applies only for Arjuna? Anyone? We hope it doesn't apply. <laughs> okay. So actually, rather than it's being it one or zero, the Gita is both spoken to a particular person and there are the dynamics of that particular relationship. But the Gita's message transcends that particular setting and those particular dynamics. So we can say, if you want to understand this, we can talk about Krishna's circle of love. So everybody at one level is included in Krishna's circle of love. But it may be at different degrees. So we could consider many levels, but let's start with something basic. So we say that here, this is spoken for Arjuna. Mm -hmm. But it is not only for Arjuna. Isn't it? Krishna loves everyone. Mm -hmm. So Krishna even says that he is the well-wisher, for example, of all devotees. He is Bhakta Vatsalaha. So we could say it is for devotees. Then it is said that he is a Brahmana Priya. Namo Brahmana Devaya. So those who are pious, those who are virtuous, those who are focusing on higher values of life, we could say that in Krishna is, these words apply to them. But then, Krishna also says that he is Surudam Sarvabhutanam. So he's not just Brahmanas, he's all living beings. And in the Bhagavatam, Prahlad says that, Lanara says that, my dear Lord, you are not just Bhakta Vatsala, you are Krupana Vatsala. Krupana Vatsala means those people who are miserly, those who are short-sighted, those who are materialistic. So actually, we put it this way that, that this is the Krupanas. And beyond that, all living beings, not just human, but everyone. So everyone is included at some place or the other in Krishna's circle of love. Now, in fact, we could take this circle further. And we could say there's Arjuna over here, but there could be there could be the Rajavasis inside, there could be the gopis, and there could be Radharani. So Arjuna is a very intimate devotee of Krishna, but there are more intimate devotees also. 
So like that, Krishna's love expands outwards in various circles. And everyone has a place in that circle of love. I once gave a class on the topic, God does not believe in atheists. Normally what do we say? Atheists <laughs> don't believe in God. <laughs> so, yeah, that means that people may say that, okay, God doesn't, uh, that I don't believe in God. But that, Krishna doesn't see that too much. That's just superficial conception, misconception that you have. But beyond that, actually the soul is a part of Krishna. And soul has, uh, Krishna loves every soul. So everyone is within Krishna's circle of love. And verses like this, they are at one level giving us a, a, a glimpse of the intimate loving reciprocation between Krishna and Arjuna. But they are also demonstrating the potential which is present in all of us. Each of us, wherever we may be right now. So, even if say we are over here right now. Hmm, each of us can actually move towards an inner circle of love. And in fact, the Gita is actually an expression of Krishna's love. And it is an invitation for our love. That is the essential message of the Gita. What is it? It is an expression of Krishna's love for all of us. And it is an invitation for our love. So in that, this is how much God loves each one of us. And therefore, let us reciprocate. Let us seek to enter into a, in a more intimate circle of love. And especially the last verses of the Gita, they talk about Krishna's love very much. So, with this background, now let's try to understand if Krishna loves us, then how do we perceive that love? Or why are we sometimes not able to perceive that love? For many people, leave alone God's love, they may even question God's existence. And that's understandable. Sometimes life can be very difficult. And sometimes you may feel that God is not helping us at all. Then it's understandable that we may doubt God's existence. And at such times, we need to, if we are to actually perceive, or just perceive God's existence, when we talk about Krishna consciousness. Today morning I was talking with uh, one devotee and in fact, he says that, you know, we, we don't have any books talking about God's existence. No devotee has written any book directly about God's existence. He says, yes, that is true. And yes, maybe some devotee should write a book on that. But the point is, Krishna consciousness goes far beyond just simply God, accepting God's existence. It is not just that God exists, but that God is the center of existence. God is the purpose of existence. So it is not international society for Krishna belief. It is Krishna consciousness. So a lot of people say, yeah, when I started practicing bhakti, uh, I started sharing it with my relatives. So my uncle said, I, I, I was giving some rational proof for the existence of God. So I believe in God. He's happy there. I'm happy here. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, in our relationship with God, there are broadly, in the con if you want to talk about the journey of consciousness, if you want to go towards Krishna Consciousness. At the first level, we talk about His existence. Mm -hmm. Then, after that, the second stage is, is His relevance. Okay, He may exist, but how does that make any difference to you? Mm -hmm. So, there are those who don't even believe His existence, who are they called? Atheists. 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 Yes. Now, there are many people who are not Atheists, but there is a new philosophical term. These are called as, technically they are called as nuns. Nuns or somewhere they call as apathists. You know, whether God exists or not, I don't care. Doesn't matter. So they say that if this God, even if God exists, so what? He exists, what is the whole, what is the negative difference? So the relevance of the existence of God, 
we understand. Then after that, the next stage is we understand his benevolence. Benevolence means that he's kind, he's, he's a gentleman, he cares for us. And then after that, we understand his transcendence. And in Krishna consciousness, our focus is primarily on these two levels. His benevolence and his transcendence. That's why sometimes the, the more preliminary, preliminary levels of God consciousness are not discussed at all. But it is not that difficult. See, the nature of the world is that the world is meant to facilitate our desires. Not unlimitedly, but circumstantially, depending on our karma. So if somebody wants to be an atheist, then in the world, Pull down, pull down. <laughs> <laughs> so, we have... Is this better now? Sometimes they say that uh, Krishna's pastimes are wonderful in the spiritual world, but they are even more wonderful in the material world. Why? Because in the spiritual world everything is bright. So, I mean, brightness, brightness is shine out. But the material world is dark. So in darkness, brightness shines up. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like that. Make dark, then something becomes clear. So we are discussing about how God's existence and relevance. These are initial things which are often not talked about. Mm -hmm. Now, it is not that the Bhagavad doesn't talk much about it. It is mentioned. Yeah. So the idea is, the world is a place for facilitating our desires. So if we look at the evidence of the world, that means what we will see in the world. Now there is, if somebody wants to turn their consciousness toward God, there is enough evidence for the existence of God. So we can say yes, there is evidence. But no, also there is evidence. Why? The purpose is basically what do you desire? Let's try to understand some simple examples. If we say consider the example of a cloud. Now, we most life forms, at least we humans, live on land. And we often live in land. And we need water. We may have our water transport systems, but they are no match with the nature's water transport system. <coughs> what is that? Clouds. A cloud is like a mobile, air-powered, aircraft-proof water tank. With all our technology, even the designers of the Twin Towers couldn't make an aircraft-proof building. So, this is extraordinary technology. How the water comes from the oceans to the land and provides for our needs. So when we look at this, and it's not just one thing. There, I have written a book on science and spirituality, and I talk about how there are hundreds of things in nature which are vital for our existence. Now suppose two people are playing a gambling match, and it's a high stakes gambling match. The stake is either, if it falls six, you live. If it falls anything else, you will be executed. So you throw the dice up. Everybody's watching it beating breath. It was six. <sighs> but then another round is there. Again you throw it. Again, same six. And again it falls six. Now, if it happens not once, not twice, not thrice, but if it happens not just a dozen times, a hundred times. Doesn't the ice have six on all sides? <laughs> <laughs> so each time it is falling six, there has to be something special over there. So similarly, there are, there are scientists have found over a hundred factors which need to be exactly precise 
for humans to exist. If the earth were a little closer to the sun or a little further from the sun, it would be too cold or too hot and you would not be able to survive. If the earth were moving around the sun at a little faster speed or a little slower speed, it would be either faster you have tornadoes, same way the earth would be rotating faster. If it would be rotating slower, it would be revolving slower, then the, the day and night would not change fast enough. Days would become too hot, nights would become too cold. Mm -hmm. If the earth's magnetic axis were not at a different degree from its vertical axis, from its, ge from its geographical axis or a, uh, geometrical axis, then again we would not have the alternation of seasons. If the person of oxygen was a little less or a little more, survival would be little. And the more science is studied, the more we are finding parameters like this. So now these don't necessarily prove the existence of God, but they do point towards some higher organizing principle. So these are a little more sophisticated, but range is something simple. Now somebody may say, oh yeah, this is a significant amount of organization in the universe. But an atheist may ask, if rains were made, so that people could have water, life living, life forms could have water for living. Then why does it rain on the oceans? Well, it rains on the oceans so that atheists can ask this question. <laughs> <laughs> you see, God does not force belief in him on anyone. That's why in nature, he has given things which can lead us to questioning God's existence. But if you look at the overall evidence, yeah, water falls on the oceans, but water falls on land also. And water falls on the oceans is nothing miraculous. Water is uh, clouds are formed from on the mostly running to the oceans. So naturally, the clouds <coughs> and the water will fall over there. But the fa if you go to a big house and there are thirty-five rooms, it's a, pa it's a palace, thirty-five rooms in it, and thirty-four rooms are clean and tidy, and one room is utterly disordered. We say, oh, this room is disorderly, therefore, this palace has no caretaker. Well, yeah, it's a valid inference from a finite evidence. We are neglecting all the other evidence. That the room is disorderly is not surprising. But that all the other rooms are well ordered, neat and tidy, that is surprising. And we could explain, maybe for some reason, maybe it's a kid's room and that's why it is untidy. Maybe the okay, caretaker, uh, the store not to clean this room for some reason. So the fact that the remaining rooms are clean, that requires explanation. And the most logical explanation is that there is a caretaker who is taking care of this rooms. So similarly, what happens is, in the Gita, Krishna, especially in the 15th chapter, he talks about how he uses the word Jnana Chakshu. What does this mean? Does anyone know? Jnana Chakshu. Eyes of, eyes. 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 Eyes of knowledge. So he talks about this in verses primarily 12 to 15. And he says that those with the eyes of knowledge can see both God's existence and even his benevolence. See, once we see his benevolence, then automatically we will see his relevance. If somebody is kind and charitable and helpful, then that person certainly matters for us. If we are in trouble, we can take their help. Even if we are not in trouble, we are in a good situation, but maybe their help can help us become better. So, if Krishna talks about how there is organization in the world at various levels. In the twelfth verse, he says, Yadaditikatam Tejo Jagadbhasete Akhilam so he's talking at the cosmological level. That the sun is the source of energy for our existence. Both light and heat, all forms of energy. Now we have energy crisis. Now we think that uh, uh, fossil fuels and other things are going to run out or they are going to damage the environment. And they're trying to see where we can get other energy. Now especially because of the geopolitical crisis, your prices are becoming higher. And all this is true. But with the best geopolitical arrangements, even with the best eco-friendly policies, if 
if the sun had not been there, we would not have any energy. So our basic existence depends on God's background arrangements. Then after that, the next verse Krishna talks about how beyond the cosmological, we can look at the terrestrial. He says, Kama Vishya Chibhutani Bharayami Ham Ojasa Pushnami Chaushadi Sarva Somo Bhutvara Satmaka He says the earth exists and it floats in space. Now we may call it gravity and that's fine. Gravity is a name for a mechanism. Gravity is not the explanation for the mechanism. There's a difference between the two. That gravity existed even before like, Newton, invent, Newton, Newton discovered it. So what is already existing, Newton gave a name for it. But naming a thing is not same as explaining its existence. Why does gravity exist? Where does it come from? It's a fundamental question. Einstein eventually tried to talk about time, space, union and try to explain it. But still there are questions that remain. So at the terrestrial level, the very existence of the earth is a miracle. And we see that that is God's arrangement. Then he talks about the ecological level. In the same verse he says that Pushnami Chaushiti Sarva Somo Bhutmar That our we are sustained by vegetables, fruits, even people who are primarily non-vegetarians, they will not have meat to eat if nature did not provide edible vegetables. So all the vegetation that nourishes life. Krishna says, it is I who make the arrangement for that. We may talk about photosynthesis and this and that. And it's fine as far as we understand it. And once the Prabhupada was talking with the scientist, Dr. Manford, he says, the Prabhupada asked Swamiji, so Prabhupada asked, so what is the current scientific knowledge about the soul? So Prabhupada said that. So the scientist said, currently we have no scientific knowledge about the soul. He said, Prabhupada, then you have no, no knowledge at all, Prabhupada says. No, Swamiji, scientific knowledge is a different kind. If they are walking in a path, and says, now just look at this grass. He said, now we have two large volumes of books, so 1970s, explaining how grass grows. And Prabhupada said, even without those books, the grass was growing. <laughs> <laughs> now, the Prabhupada's problem is not to trivialize the knowledge. And Prabhupada said, so the Dr. Benford is doing this form. If God did not want us to study the grass, why did he put it there? So Prabhupada said, my point is that you study the grass and you forget the God who put it there. <laughs> <laughs> so, mechanisms are fine enough to understand. But mechanisms are not causes. Mechanisms explain systems by which how things happen. But how did the mechanism come about is still a question. So, the mechanisms require an explanation beyond the mechanisms. I'll talk about this a little later, but let's quickly go over this verse. Then this was set of verse. In the 14th verse, then Krishna talks about our physiological mechanisms. He talks about Aham Vaishwana Robhutva Praninam Deham Ashita Pranapana Sama Yukta Pachamyanam Chaturvidham. So he talks about it. He says that it is. The digestive system, the digestive mechanism, it is he who arranges for the digestive mechanism by which we are able to digest food. Actually, digestion is a great miracle. Now, why is it a miracle? Because, see, converting one form of energy into another form of energy is not a very easy thing to do. We need complex plants for doing that. But our body does that and it does it in a very efficient way. And many organs in the body, if they're damaged, now we can replace them. If somebody's limb gets injured, then you can have prosthesis. If the eyes get damaged, you can have glasses or we can have surgery. We can, we can do many things. If somebody's heart is not working, we can have pacemaker. Kidney is not working, we can have dialysis. Now, despite all our technological advances, scientists are still struggling to replace the digestive mechanism. If somebody has a poor digestion, you cannot put an artificial digester into their body. They tried it, but even with nanotechnology, they found that a digestive, we would not need a digestive machine, we would need a digestive factory. <laughs> and it would run into males. So, 
It's an extremely complicated mechanism how digestion happens. So, you know, we just take a morsel of food and we may think, oh, if I didn't work hard, God would, would God provide me food? And even if we work hard and God provide and we get food, and if God did not, he would not digest the food. No, we just eat the food and forget it. But how is it converted into energy? See, the only time we think about our digestion is when it doesn't work. <laughs> so, so, God gives and forgives. We get and forget. We get and forget. So, actually speaking, our very existence depends on so many factors which are not in our control and which are not even in our awareness. Now, every day, if you are going out, we think about the sun only, is it too hot or not too hot? Mm -hmm. You don't think because of the sun I am existing and then I wonder if I am feeling hot or not hot. Isn't it? So these, all these factors, they are often not even in our awareness. And many times we have certain issues in our life you know, you know, I wanted this job, I wanted this raise, I wanted to get this house, I wanted to buy this smartphone, and it didn't get, I didn't get it. And we become upset, we become irritated, we become angry, and we feel unhappy, we feel resentful, and we start thinking, okay, why are my plans not working, why are my desires not being fulfilled? And we start thinking that if our desires are not fulfilled, then it does not really love me, it does not care for me. So our situation often is like a child. Now a child in a home, you no, know, for the child to exist and function in home, you know, there are hundreds of things that have to work. The child is not even aware. The child feels uncomfortable. Child feels a little hot. Maybe there's a cooler over there. Child feels cold. There's a comfort over there. There are hundreds of things which are arranged for the child to live comfortably. But maybe uh, the child wants a new video game. And the child doesn't get that video game. The child says to her parents, You don't love me only. <laughs> so, what is happening is the child reduces the love of the parents to that one desire that is not fulfilled. And the hundred needs that are provided, that the child doesn't even think about them. So, sometimes our attachments also do something like that to us. Now what attachment does is attachments in general they narrow our vision. That means when we are attached we see only that particular thing. Am I getting it or am I not getting it? And when our vision is narrowed then if that particular thing is not arranged for that particular problem is not solved, that particular desire is not fulfilled, then we become oblivious to the hundreds of things that have been arranged, that are being arranged, because of which you are able to survive, because of which you are able to function, because of which you are able to succeed, to whatever degree we have succeeded in our life. We forget that. And therefore, we start asking, where is God's love? So now, it's natural for all of us to have desire. The children wanting toys is not a bad thing. But children reducing their parents' love to the parents giving or not giving a toy, that is not a healthy thing. Similarly, as conscious beings, we will have desires. We may also get attached to things. That's just human. But when, what happens is, that our desires and attachments, they become so strong that they become the filter through which we are seen. God's existence and God's benevolence, then that is unhealthy. That can even become toxic. That's why it is important for us, whenever good things, whatever good things are there in our life, we need to see them as, as arrangements of Krishna. We may say that, actually, these are not Krishna's arrangements. These are a result of my hard work. Well, yes, true. They are a result of our hard work. But again, our hard work, it's like, see, every day we see birds. Birds wake up in the morning and they chirp and they search. The birds have to search for food. And that is vital. 
It's not that they sit in their nest and food will come in their nest. They have to search for food. But their searching is not the same as arranging of the food. That they don't produce the grains. They don't arrange for the grains. The grains are already arranged. So, so, so the bird searching in one sense is necessary but it is not sufficient. Their searching doesn't produce the food. Similarly, our hard work is necessary but it is not sufficient. No matter how hard we work, if tomorrow there is a famine, we may not get any food. So our work, our endeavor is secondary. God's arrangement is primary. And we need to be able to see beyond our arrangements. Yeah, we work hard. We, we, we have built a career, we have a house, we have wealth. If we had to work hard, we wouldn't have water. That's true. But even for us to work hard and attain something, we all got many lucky breaks in our life. And we got a good job, we got a good contact, we, we found a field in which we could work well and we could perform and excel. So, there is our provision. Our provision means our arrangement. And there is divine provision. And both are important. So actually, if you consider, there is vision and there is provision. So material vision sees only our provision. Now I work hard and I achieve this. But spiritual vision means we see our provision, but we see also the divine provision. We see this, this is important. But this is, you could say, far more important. Without the divine provision, we wouldn't be able to do anything. And in that way, even in our daily life, when we, when we see the very good thing around our life, we can actually feel grateful to each of those things. And nowadays, what is happening is, gratitude is being very much valued. People recognize you feel, should feel grateful, you should not feel resentful. Because if you are not grateful, you are constantly unhappy. As they say, if you are not grateful, then you are a great fool. <laughs> <laughs> so, we are great. There are so many things right in our life. We are a great fool if you are not great fool. So, it's for us to choose what we should be. So, it's important to be grateful. But, I conclude with this one important point. That what are we grateful for? See, for everything that happens, we can look at the event at various causal levels. Say, for example, I am here and some good things have happened to me. So I could say, this is because my parents raised me well. My parents gave me good education. That, is, that could be true at one level. Then we can look at that again. You know, maybe I had good teachers at my school. They taught me well. Then we could look beyond to say that maybe I had friends who helped me. Then we could look beyond that and we could say that I live in a country where the country is well managed. I mean, nobody thinks the country is well managed. But at least it's not so mismanaged that every morning we have to wake up and worry whether we will live or die the next day we on the street. We can, look, we can look at various levels and all these arrangements are required. But we see, spiritual vision means we see that okay, that all these arrangements that are there, all these arrangements that are there, they are all ultimately arranged by Krishna. It is that when a, when a child is newborn, one of the most intimate acts of affection is the mother breastfeeding her child. It is with her own body's milk that she is feeding the child. And definitely it's the mother's love for the child. At the same time, it is not just the mother's love. Because the mother does not do anything special to manufacture milk in her breast at that time when, when the child was born. The same God who send a child into her womb and through her womb into the world, also send milk for that child in the breast. So, a mother breastfeeding a child is both the mother's expression of love for that child and God's expression of love for that child. 
so the immediate cause and the ultimate cause they both work together so some people see only the immediate cause and then neglect the ultimate cause that is not complete vision others can go and they can look at only the ultimate cause and neglect the immediate cause that is also not right we acknowledge the immediate cause and we also see beyond the immediate cause to the ultimate cause so we talk about gratitude like we are you talking about the krishna's expanding circles of love so like that we can say we can also have expanding circles of gratitude and that depends on our expansion of consciousness a child feels grateful only when a child gets some toys or some gifts on on christmas or diwali or janmash whatever it is a feel very grateful but as a child grows the child starts seeing Oh, so many things are reached for my parents. For my parents, the child's consciousness expands. The child starts seeing there's so much for me to be grateful. Similarly, for us, as our consciousness expands, it is not that we reject all these immediate circles. It is not that a devotee doesn't care for the country that we live in. A devotee doesn't care for the community that we live in. A devotee doesn't care for the dynasty that we live in. It's very important because they all have. be the means through which krishna has expressed love and means means they are not just it's not just like a machine it's conscious individuals who took the responsibility they may themselves be or not be krishna conscious that's a different question but we can be krishna conscious about their role in our life and there is that famous prayer many of you may have heard it tomeva mata cha pita tomeva tomeva bandhushya sakha tomeva फादर्स and then that's where the child grows child is nourished not just physically but emotionally socially so tumhe wo bandhush se sakha to me as we grow up you know we need knowledge knowledge to function in the world we need wealth to function in the world so even not just conscious beings but also because they are unconscious things like wealth and wisdom this these are also manifestations of god the intelligence that we have the knowledge that we acquire it may not be only spiritual knowledge even the technical knowledge that we have by the by which we are functioning as professionals in life that knowledge is also a manifestation of krishna it is krishna's blessing to us tomeva vidya dharmam tomeva in wealth we see it is it is actually krishna's expression of affection for us so if we see all of these in a inclusive way then we will see that krishna's love for us is perceivable through various blessings so we can see krishna's benefits and the last part is krishna's transcendence. transcendence so transcendence means what that there are times when various signs of benevolence various material things can give us safety they can give us pleasure they can give us prestige there are many things and these are not necessarily bad things and you can see in all these the blessings of god and that's good we need to see god at that level but ultimately if we are only looking so this is another way so all these for us we can see in them god's benevolence but the problem is that these things they may sometimes go away and if you are seeing god's love only in say our our financial prosperity our social prestige our all our family being together with us and sometimes those things may not last and then you start thinking where is god's love so when we see god's transcendence what it means is we will if we connect with krishna as a person you know he can provide us happiness even in the absence of success so normally all these 
we see as success. And we see success as a source of happiness. See, I got wealth, I got prestige, I got a good family, and I'm successful. Because I'm successful, I'm happy. And yes, that is one way to see Krishna's love for us. But another way is that things will be falling apart in our life. But if we are connected with Krishna as a person, if we are remembering Krishna, we are chanting his holy names, if we are hearing his katha, even when things are falling apart in our life, still we will experience some sublime sense of peace, a sublime sense of purpose, a sublime sense of, of even pleasure that yeah, Krishna is still with me, Krishna is still with me things are going to be alright. And in that way, we will experience Krishna's transcendence. So ultimately, we progress toward transcendence. If our relationship with Krishna and our perception of Krishna's love is only based on his benevolence, especially benevolence in material terms, then sooner or later we start thinking, where is Krishna? Now, why is he not doing this for me? I earlier talked about toys and toys can seem trivial. Yeah, maybe I can get a bigger job, better job, I can get a bigger house. But when some of even our basics are not taken care of, if our health starts getting uh, is being destroyed, apparently for no nothing that we have done at all. Or oh, some of our relationships start to fall apart. People who are close to us start misunderstanding us. So if we are seeing God's love in these arrangements alone, then we feel God doesn't love me at all. But we see Krishna's love in the transcendence. That even when these things fall apart, still we can connect with Krishna, still we can experience Krishna. And in that we can experience peace, purpose, pleasure. That is what happened to Parikshit Maharaj. His life was, because he was supremely blessed. He was powerful, handsome, young, wonderful family. Popular ruler, and on top of that, he was virtuous. So he put everything that could be right was right in his life. And so much benevolence. And one moment, everything was lost. Cursed to die in seven days. And then, what did he do? He did not question Krishna's benevolence. Rather, he focused on Krishna's transcendence. Let me hear about Krishna, let me absorb myself in Krishna. When he did that, he experienced Krishna's love so much so that eventually when the snake bird came and bit him, it was only his body, his heart, his soul was already absorbed in Krishna, was already with Krishna. And he didn't even experience the snake bite, that fearsome snake bite which put his whole body in flames, that he didn't even experience it. Now, we will rarely face a, a, a challenge or a threat. As, as, as sinister as what Parishit Maharaj faced. And most of us don't have a sentence which is irreversible like that. But when we face difficulties, if we focus on Krishna's transcendence, then we will find that Krishna's love is there for us. In fact, that will give us greater realization of our spirituality. If we see Krishna's love only in material things, then we think, ah, I'm a material being. But if we start seeing Krishna's love, even in the absence of material things, that will give us spiritual realization. That material things are falling apart, still I am okay. That means I am not a material thing. I am a spiritual being. So when material things fall apart, what will happen is, we will get spiritual realization. And this is ultimately the conclusion of the Bhagavad Gita. Arjuna has to fight a terrible war, his warriors, or his relatives are going to die in that. But Krishna gives him a wonderful vision that there is a bigger person. So we can put it that. <coughs> One way we could put it is that things will be okay in the end. That ultimately Krishna's plan, they'll not just be okay, they'll be much more than okay. And if things are not okay, you know, this one sentence, it say, summarize the whole class. If things are not okay, 
it is not the end <laughs> <laughs> the story is not yet over there is more to come sometimes in a in a movie the villain seems to be powerful the villain seems to be beating up the hero beating up the hero beating up the hero <laughs> what kind of story is this this walk out of the sometimes what time that we find that we are we are suffering very little from all sides and sometimes we may walk out of the movie of our own life <laughs> literally some people just end their lives by committing suicide others they just become so depressed so pessimistic but don't do that oh it is it is not the end this is just one phase in a multi 